All right. Um, so, all right. So the thing is, I remember, like, I used to watch Reason and well, Theology. Man, it was one of my... Man, do you want what? this on Twitter, too, or do you want me to take it off of there? No, you can leave it on Twitter. Okay. <laughs> I want to always give people a way to see it if they don't pay, but um, the... Uh, I used to love reason and theology. I used to love watching some of the disagreements. I, I I remember like watching shows with you, Tim Flanders, Michael Lofton. These were such fruitful conversations. Uh, you know, some of them talked me off the ledge at certain points, but then at a certain point, it kind of just became the Michael Lofton show instead of reason and theology. Like, what what were some of those fractures? What what started there? Well, you know. Um... When we first started Reason in Theology, we had no idea what it was going to become. Uh, yeah. So, you know, Michael was Eastern Orthodox when it started. Uh, I was Catholic. He was working a regular day job. This is stuff that he has said in his public testimony anyway. So, so you, so he was still Eastern Orthodox when you guys I started the channel. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, he was Eastern Orthodox. I was Catholic. It was supposed to be a show that was going to host our conversations that we had in private that, you know, we would talk for hours about things. And we thought to ourselves, like, man, wouldn't it be really nice to just, like, record this and have other people here and maybe help us out, tell us to read this? Maybe they're going to get helped by what we're saying. So that's how it started. And we didn't know if it was going to get past 50 followers, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, like, the issue of, like, it becoming a business or nothing like that was even a thought. And I was never in it for money. I never got one cent. In fact, I still haven't gotten one cent from yeah. YouTube. Um, even in my own channel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's uh, you know but for, for anybody that doesn't know you don't make money on youtube unless you're no. unless you're getting a hundred thousand views per video like you get peanuts i think yeah. me and rob get like a hundred bucks each a month or something it's it's mm. nothing <laughs> like so uh you know uh but after a while he started he brought another eastern orthodox guy on so there was two orthodox one catholic then we brought elijah yassi um Another Orthodox priest, we brought a Muslim on, we brought William Albrecht. And so after a while, it, it started to grow, you know, mm -hmm. and people started to enjoy the show. And, and then Michael started to make like these billboards with like me, William and, and himself. And, um, you know, so it got pretty big. And, uh, but None of us had a very, we didn't have assignments. None of us were, you know, like I was always getting people on the show. I'd, I'd go to, I'd go to universities and go through the faculty and start sending emails to people who want to come on to talk about their specialty, you know, and that's how we got on a lot of the, we got a lot of good people on. Yeah. Um, but none of us had like assignments. It was just a free, you know, it was just a, a, a something that we all got involved with and none of us were trying to get anything out of it other than a chance to learn you and know? add to the conversation right like and add to the conversation but, yeah yeah like part of the reason i wanted to start this was because i wanted to add something to the conversation it was like i was hearing a lot of things going on and i was hearing i, I saw kind of these groups breaking off and i'm like i think i have something to add to the conversation i have a couple of thoughts that i think nobody's talking about and i kind of want to bring people together so i'm assuming you guys wanted to just bring your own flavor to the conversation yeah, exactly. And, you know, for those of you who don't know Michael's background, you know, he has shared in his public testimony that he was once a rad trad and left the Catholic Church in 2015 or 2016. And I was there with him when that happened. And, you know, I, I you know, I, uh, I stayed friends with him. You know, I yeah. couldn't talk. I couldn't talk him off the ledge. You know, he, 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 he had to, you know, he, he had his issues. But when he came back, you know, so we started, you know, I kept my friendship with him. So when he went to orthodoxy, um, we said, hey, let's create this show where we're talking about Catholicism, orthodoxy, church history. But what ended up happening was he started to he started to look into the Catholic Church again, 
which is something I, I didn't expect. Yeah. You know, he was Orthodox. So uh, he started to look into Catholicism more and more. And so as R&T got bigger, he, he actually came back to the Catholic Church. And that happened while the other Orthodox was still one of the contributors. And that created a little, I think it created a little bit of friction. Um, Craig Trulia, that was the first Eastern Orthodox guy. Um, don't want to get into that story, but yeah, he yeah, yeah. had to go. Um, and I think what ended up happening was Michael wanted it to become a Catholic apologetics channel, you know. And none of us had a problem with that because I was Catholic, William yeah. was Catholic, um, you know, but we still tried to keep like Father Patrick, the Orthodox priest, we still tried to get um, uh, Turretin fan, Reform, uh, Reform Presbyterian. We still tried to keep it eclectic, but some of the shows started to get more and more like, okay, Catholicism is true. And we're, you know, we're going to promote Catholicism. And then eventually he had to get over his hurdle with Pope Francis because Michael did not like Pope Francis. Yeah. I mean, he, he has told his audience that we all know it. Um, so in order, I think in order, so he basically, ch he had a big change of mind to, yeah. to say, to say the least. He just, he started to look at things differently and um he started but that was and that was kind of a slow process too because i remember at first he was kind of like just trying to be charitable about it it was seemed like the, the the further francis went the harder he would start doubling down and like it, it was a yes. weird thing it wasn't like an overnight switch he he because at first he was like well you know we should because i remember him talking like he would still talk to people who were like you know francis is the pope but you know he's he's not the he's a bad pope and, it's, and then he just wouldn't even have a conversation with anyone who even had uh maybe a confused attitude towards francis yeah well i was one of them i i i'm i i always i've always been very concerned about Pope Francis, and I was never shy about that on reason and theology. So it, it got to the point where uh, Michael started to produce shows where he was bringing shame on people who were finding what Pope Francis was doing, what the hierarchy was doing, what the Vatican was doing, as uh, scandalous, yeah. you know, and, and so he started to slowly shift and say, well, wait a minute, maybe the cause of the scandal is the trads, not Pope Francis, but a particular misinterpretation of Pope Francis. And when that happened, I kind of stepped in and I said, that's not true. And it's abundantly clear that that's not true. And so I, I made it clear I didn't agree with the way he was shaming trads and conservatives, people who were not rad trads. Yeah, that's a, that's the point. It's not like our audience is not rad trads. 90% of our audience right. goes to the Novus Ordo, dude. It's like, right. but they're still seeing it. And, and I described it as to, to think that Francis uh, is... Uh, like to, to interpret it the way Michael does in my eyes is the same level of like cognitive dissonance that is required to say that a man in a dress is a woman. Like, it's just, come on, don't tell me I'm not seeing yes. what I'm seeing. Yes. I see what I see. Yes, exactly. So, and, and, and that's what, like, for example, uh, I gave an imaginary example, uh, a few days ago. I said, I, I said, what, what would it happen? What would happen? If Pope Francis allowed a female Anglican bishop in a Catholic church to celebrate the Eucharist, and then Pope Francis received communion from her, yeah, right, there would be outrage, right? Well, I almost picture the Pope's blainers coming out and saying, "Well, look, Anglicans don't have orders; females can't." Per uh, confect the sacrament he just took a piece of bread from a lady 
That, that's not even crazy to say. So did did any of them discuss the Justin Welby situation? Well, that's why I'm lead, that's why I bring this up is because you see how crazy it would be to come out and say, "Why are the trads losing their minds? He just took a piece of bread from a uh, from a you know a fully vested female Anglican bishop, right? He's it's just a piece of bread, right? Um, well, that's crazy. Well, I didn't think that Michael Lofton was going to defend what happened with Justin Welby. But he did. He did. And he came up with a bunch of far-fetched reasons for why this is not a big problem. And, you know, his reasoning was that, well, Anglican orders, we're still kind of iffy on that nowadays. You know, yes, we used to think it was completely sure. Now there's like people questioning it. And who knows, maybe Justin Welby is part of a line that comes from a schismatic bishop that came from the Catholic Church. So he actually had valid orders. And maybe Justin Welby, who was ordained into the diaconate in 1992, that was the first defense, which is far-fetched. Yeah. The second defense was, well, even Benedict said that when Anglicans celebrate the Eucharist, it's not a real Eucharist, but there is some value in it. You do get calories from the bread, I suppose. <laughs> you do get calories. <laughs> well, <from> yeah. <laughs> right. Rob, yeah, I, but, you, you, but, you, win but, the, you win the conversation. But Eric, That's think about it, 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 <laughs> It's true. There is some value. Yeah, but right. think about the think about the shift in the Catholic conversation because there was a time where we would have called that sacrilege. That's right. That's what it is. We would have called that's, that sacrilege. We would have said that's a is. mockery of the sacrament. That's right. That's right. This is this is what um, anybody from 1955 backwards mm -hmm. would have said is an indefensible act of sacrilege. Right. Well. According to Lofton, he had some far-fetched reasons to defend what Pope Francis... And then he said this, if worse comes to worse and none of my explanations work, then that just means that Pope Francis was wrong and my position still not disproven because I don't believe that ability. It's like, but wait a minute, you're not giving due acknowledgement of all the all of the lines that were crossed, yeah, the scandal upon scandal. Yeah, Francis is sending out an Anglican because this whole project of ecumenism is doomed because none of it has bringing the outsiders into the fold in mind. It's dialogue for the sake of dialogue. Something needs to change about that. Like at least under Benedict. Um, under Benedict, it was he was having these conversations with the Lutherans, and they were trying to hammer out something doctrinal on justification together, right? Where they could come right. to a joint statement. It was like that was that was the the goal in mind. It's like let's let's try to find some place of unity here. Where with Francis, it's like there's there's no need for unity. Let's just just be just let's be just different. be friends. Yeah, let's yeah. just be friends and call it eat communion. Well, look, there was a, he was in a Lutheran church one time, and a Lutheran got up and asked him. And this is recorded on YouTube, so anybody can go look at look this up. She said, "She said, uh, Pope Francis, I am the wife of a Catholic. I'm a Lutheran, so I don't believe in Catholicism. When I go to church with my husband, can I receive communion?" And Everybody was like, whoa, that was a bold question to ask, right? So everybody's waiting for the yes or the no. What he says is this three-minute long explanation of how Lutherans and Catholics have a shared baptism. And, you know, there's differences in the language about the Eucharist and... Although he wouldn't give the permission, he kind of recommends her to kind of do a discernment 
and then go based off of that. I remember that because I think because, because what I really do think is that the ultimate goal is open communion and it's and we've lost this understanding of how sacred the sacrament is man and it's scary because the language St. Paul uses about those who do not discern the body and blood of our Lord is yeah. damnation. I mean that's the language you you drink damnation upon yourself if you do not discern the body and blood of our lord and and the it's just this yeah. watering down this watering down and the eh, this isn't that important this isn't that important it's 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 detrimental that us as fathers especially make sure we convey the faith to our children because it's obviously not coming from the church itself anymore and it's it's been passed down to our responsibility to me. I mean, it always has been anyway, but it's yeah. very important nowadays that we as fathers step up. Yeah. And what you just described there is, is you use the term watered down. That's the problem with the, with the Francis pontificate is that he's completely watered things down, giving the impression that Catholicism is changing its beliefs. But yeah. see, here, here's the difficulty. If 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 you have a if you have a judge in in Milwaukee and a judge in Illinois or, or, or Chicago Illinois and they both hold to the same law the law of the land let's just you know call it your 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 civil law of the land but the Milwaukee judge has a very like pobrecito outlook on criminals he's like man but look you know they're just all having a hard time and yeah. you don't know what it's like to be in their shoes and and so he's just like handing people back out on the street and lowering sentences and basically exonerating criminals yeah, in new york criminals. i know exactly what that's like <laughs> <laughs> so you have a, a judge in milwaukee like that but then if if the judge in chicago and it's i'm not trying to match reality here this is yeah, yeah no, i know <laughs> if the judge in chicago actually said well wait a minute it doesn't care i don't care how i feel I need to protect the common good. I need to distribute justice. So both judges hold to the same letter of the law. But if you live in Milwaukee and then move to Chicago, it will feel like yeah. a completely different world and therefore yeah. a completely different religion. Yeah. But they're both holding to the same legal code. Yeah. And, and so that's the problem with Francis is that he has protected himself because anybody who wants to come with sword and shield about how he has changed teaching, he's got Neo from the Matrix. He can do all Well, kinds well it's even worse than that because the, the judge in Illinois, Francis, would yank. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. the You know what I mean? So that's that's what makes it even tougher because... Anytime somebody in any kind of position of um, of uh, the you know of the, uh, in the church, any, any a priest, a bishop, anything, Francis will put pressure on them to conform to his more you know Milwaukee style. Yeah, and that's and that's what he wants. He wants the Milwaukee style universally distributed throughout the whole church, yeah. while still confessing the the illinois style holding to the confession of the illinois style but in practice it's it's the milwaukee style. exactly yeah he's saying, look he's like you know like what well, if you're talking about what we believe go to go go read denzinger i remember one one archbishop bruno during the days of amoris Letitia and the family synods they you know somebody i think it was diana montagna said is church teaching changing yeah. And I think Bruno, who's very much a Francis thinker, um, said, look, if you want doctrine, go read Denzinger. You know, yeah. th go read the dogma of the church. What we're dealing with is people and their problems. Yeah. And how to reach out to people with their problems. And they don't see the, the concurrency of the expression of doctrine in pastoral management and so they just think that this is kind of like you can kind of be like jesus and just like forgive people left and right 
and just treat things like, you know, repentance on slow motion. You yeah. know, I call it repentance well, on extreme slow motion. You said something that, because I think the biggest problem with fiducia is not even the language in fiducia. It's the gesture itself that lends the, the it lends this um, appearance that the church is changing its doctrine and that the church will eventually come around to accepting same-sex marriage. Yeah. and Like it's giving this appearance as if the church will change. Look, guys, the church moves in centuries. Slow, you know, give us some time. We're moving in that direction for you. And people are very hopeful. And it's an evil lie. Like, like you are that document is an evil lie because you're giving these people the impression that God is okay with sodomy. Just not yet. Just give us some time. We'll get there. Well, yeah, it, it basically, it, it, and that's why I like the way that the Africans responded because they basically said. We strongly uphold the first half of the document, and that's why we can't put into practice the second yeah. half of the document. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because that's the, truth. The, first, the first half of the document is simply just a reaffirmation of Catholic the teaching. Catholic doctrine, right? Well, in order to protect that, one of the African bishops says we can't do we from paragraph yeah. thirty one fo following we we can't do that. Now, Eric, even in that controversial paragraph 34, because you saw the way they did the language, it wasn't if a person is if a person recognizes they, they have faults and they just want a blessing. But it's not if a person recognizes that that homosexuality is a sin and they want a blessing. It's this generic. If a person recognizes they're imperfect and they want a blessing, they could come as a couple. We're not blessing the union. But yeah. what's the like it's so imprecise and and vague that it's just a problem and it is nobody it is. nobody on that side wants to see that look you're all this document did was open up a can of worms and give i've explained it as this is basically samorum pontificum for the james martins of the world like it gives <laughs> them it gives them permission without having to go through their bishop to go and do this thing on this. It's more pontificum for gay blessings for the, every individual priest who runs a new ways ministry type ministry. Now their bishop can't do anything because these guys have a, a, a car blanche from Rome. Yeah. Well, look at the context. The context was uh, everybody was trying to figure out why Pope Francis didn't do anything with Germany. And now we know. We yeah. know it's because they were planning to throw them a juicy bone yeah. to chew on for now. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, guys, don't make a thing with the bishops' conference because that'll look like we're not in union. Just let your priest do whatever the hell your priest want to do. Right, exactly. So <laughs> the context, you know, and, and Francis, you know, all, Fernandez and Francis, when, you know, these, these people don't realize what they're, what, what they're doing. Like, the fans of the Pope's planers, uh, they don't understand how Cardinal Fernandez or Pope Francis thinks. Because for them, all Pope Francis has to do is say, it's a blessing of the individuals, not the union. And they, they're they like, wow, total win, total win, <laughs> amen. <laughs> it's like, well, hold on a second. You, you don't understand what he's doing, Okay. That's not, I mean, nobody, I mean, I've never said that he was trying to change the letter of doctrine. I mean, my first article said, this is an attempt to keep doctrine while doing this insane pastoral option yeah. that's going to certainly undermine the doctrine. Yeah. And so you can't go by affirmations, verbal affirmations. That's, that's, that we've all known that's what, Pope Francis has been doing, you know. So the yeah, the the it's definitely um it's definitely I like how you say some more pontificum for the uh that's what it is, some more pontificum for, for gay blessings. It's like you guys look, James Martin, don't worry, your bishop can't do anything to you anymore. New Ways Ministry, don't worry, your bishop can't do anything to you anymore. You guys can just do whatever you want to do, nobody's yeah. gonna stop you. And I mean, then you have people say, well, it's got to be done in a way that doesn't cause scandal. But the problem is the document itself, itself is the scandal. <laughs> <laughs> like, And, oh, and how do you do it? I mean, how how do you get this done? I mean, they come up together. They they know what the church teaches. 
and they insist on being together. Yeah. That already tells you that they're not ready to open their life to God. They're still yeah. sending a big fat no to yeah, the whole thing's about heaven. revolution. It's about revolution. It's just like the, the women who want to become priests and they say, What about the women who are called by God? No woman is called by God by the to, to the priesthood. No <laughs> woman is called by God to the priesthood. So what you're telling me is you don't care what God actually thinks, you just want to overturn the church. The whole thing's about revolution and change. And yeah. it's just that spirit of revolution that just it's in everything. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. There's people that are out to try to overturn everything, but I really do have to go to bed, man. I have to, Eric, I want to definitely get you back on again, but we'll talk offline. Um, yeah. I, I sent you my phone number in the DM. Um, maybe yeah. uh, shoot me yours. Dude, if you have any like good ideas for something we could do together, because I really do think conversations are so important, man. Yeah. It's, if you, if you give me like an assignment, like, dude, read this and then we'll, we'll talk about <laughs> it together. I'll, I'll like Rob too. We'll give him homework. Yeah, give me homework. I'll do it. Especially if something's on audio books. I spend a lot of time driving. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for having me on. It was a blast. Yeah, it was really fun meeting you, man. You're an awesome, awesome thinker. I like the way you uh, explain things. So, um, all right. Yeah, we'll yeah, see. We'll you, you guys are, you guys are, uh, you guys are turning into a really good show. I mean, I love listening to you guys now. So, oh, I mean, thank, thank you, man. Yeah, it's 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 really it's it's you guys are real, and you guys are are hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> we try to keep it light for the most part. Every once in a while, we'll delve into some of these tougher things. But it's I find it I find it uh, more interesting to just talk to different people, man. Just like yeah, you know, how are you handling this? Because we're having a hard time, but. You know, we're all figuring all right. it out together. So, yeah, dude, it was really nice to meet you. We will do this again soon. Amen. All right. Thank you.